It's going to be from Luke uh, 13, 6 through 9. Am I right? Ooh. Yeah, I looked at the wrong week. I was right to be afraid. <laughs> Do not fear. Sorry, Ken. You're right. Well, I was still at the wrong passage. But... Okay. All right, so one through nine then? All right. Cool. Well, yeah, we'll do the whole thing here. All right, uh, Luke 1, uh, Luke 13, 1 through 9, uh, English Standard Version. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think... <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you think they, that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had planted a fig tree, excuse me, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look for three years now. I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use the, up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear uh, fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Father God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for that extra year, that extra chance as we go through our lives and maybe we're not quite right on track as we've seen this morning, but you give us that extra chance, you give us that forgiveness, you give us that grace and mercy against our own failures. Lord, we bless your word in our hearts that we remember that. And Lord, we pray that every voice that speaks today, that they pass that message on well, despite our own mortal flaws, Lord. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, Chris. I always keep Chris in your prayers. Um, he uh, is a uh, transplant uh, survivor and doing great, and, and uh, just keep praying for him. It's good to see everybody here. Now, I look around, and I see green, so I know some people know that, that today is St. Patrick's Day, and that's good if you're Irish, but you know what's better is being a child of God. Amen. So, and that's what we all are. So, uh, no matter what color you are, wear, uh, drive, any of those things, um, it's great to be a child of God. And we're glad you're here today. Some folks I want you to pray for, Vicki Maxfield is having surgery. She's having gallbladder, gallbladder surgery tomorrow. So be praying for her. And then uh, and, you know, just all the other folks that are on our prayer list, keep praying for them. And then Ken's asked me to give just a really quick update about the discussions we've had with the potential charter school that was coming. And so we had a meeting, um, when, whatever it was, a week ago or so, yeah, and uh, had a great discussion about the school, had a lot of input, and the decision was uh, we're interested in doing a school, but not this time right now with this group. So there's going to be a, a, a bigger discussion, longer discussion about doing things either with homeschoolers or some other um, arrangement and then also a bigger plan. You know, we own all the property behind us, the next five acres. If you drive back there, there's two, two and a half acre plots back there. And uh, we've already talked about the potential of maybe doing another building back there and some other things. So all those discussions will be coming out. So, but, but we are not going to be uh, pursuing this with this group. So I hope if you have any questions, see one of us, see one of the elders, see Ken, see, um, uh, we'll have, be happy to discuss any of that with you. Glad everybody's here today. There's a connection card that's in your bulletin that I left laying at the back, but um, it's in your bulletin. If any prayer requests, anything you want Ken to know, any, um, if this is your first time at Crossroads, please fill that out and hold on to it. And Ken and Vanessa would love to see you at the back of the uh, room uh, after the service and give you a gift bag from the church. It's got all kinds of neat things in it. All right, during the adult Bible study, which will take place during the second service, uh, right over in the Family Life Center, it's taught by Rand and, and Howard. Both of you raise your hands. See, we strategically put them on each side of the building, so if you want to ask them a question after the service, you can grab them, but they are great, great teachers, Bible scholars. If you've not been in a class with them, uh, go try it. You will like it, and so I encourage you. Uh, they're, they're just good, wise men that, that, um, that, that have... Um, have a lot of biblical experience and, and are great teachers. So I encourage you to do that. Ladies, tomorrow night you're going to have Bunko. So if you're interested in that, there is a little flyer that tells you everything you need. You need to RSVP to, to Jenny or Michelle. Michelle, raise your hand. She's right there. You can see her uh, show up, bring a friend and a snack. So bring both of them. You'll have a lot of fun, 7 to 9 o'clock. All right. On Palm Sunday, we're going to have two services, one at 9 and, 10, and one at 1045. It's going to be the cross and the communion. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll also have two services, 9 and 1045. And I always say that is a perfect time to invite somebody. I met some neighbors of somebody just a little while ago that are here visiting for the first time. All of you have neighbors. All of you have friends. All of you have relatives that aren't actively involved in a church. I was talking to a couple yesterday that uh, are church people, but they just said, Jim, we just got out of the habit of going to church. And you know, we all have habits. Uh, and one of the habits we need to have is reading our Bible and fellowshipping with other believers. You know, it says in the Bible, yeah, and, and I had people, a guy told me the other day, he said, Jim, I watch church every Sunday, you know, or I watch Crossroads. And I said, you know, it's a whole lot more fun if you come be with us rather than just watch us. So I encourage you to do that. And then if you want to know more about Crossroads, on Sunday, April 7th, we're, uh, Ken will be teaching Next Steps. It's Class 101. Uh, we have a group of classes that you can go through. It's 101. It's Introduction to Crossroads, Everything We Believe, How to Become a Member. It's a prerequisite to being a member. You don't have to become a member if you go through it, uh, but it is a great time to, to learn more about Crossroads, everything from the start of it to uh, just the, the ideas. Um, uh, we provide you lunch, childcare, and it's a, it's a you'll, you'll really enjoy spending time 
with Ken. The only thing we need you to do is on your connection card, if you want to come, tell us how many adults and how many children so we can have enough food and prepare everything. Again, glad everybody's here today. Everybody stand up. Hope you have a great St. Patrick's Day and, and, uh, and a great day period. Thank you. And we're going to continue to worship this morning. There's a lot of people that have a lot of questions. There's a lot of people that have a lot of answers. There's one place we look for those answers. Amen. And that's right from our good, good Father. Because I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. Because you tell me that.
command the highest mountains to fall upon their knees. You're the one who welcomes sinners, and you open blinded eyes. You restored the broken hearted, and you brought the dead to life. Forgetting all our sins, you remember. this morning in, in reverence for your son Jesus Christ. Lord, we stand in wonder of your, your boundless love, Lord, infinite wisdom and unmatched power. Lord Jesus, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and you all things, Lord, are held together. And through you all things are made new, Lord. We marvel at the majesty of your creation, Lord, and the beauty of your redemption. You walked among us, demonstrating, Lord, compassion to the broken, healing the sick and bringing hope to the hopeless. Your teachings continue to inspire and transform lives, illuminating the path of righteousness for all who follow you, Lord. And Lord, in your death, you bore the weight of our sins, offering us forgiveness 
and reconciliation with God. And in your resurrection, you conquered death, Lord, granting us eternal life and victory over the grave. Lord Jesus, words fail to capture the magnitude, Lord, of your greatness. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, worthy of all honor, Lord, glory and praise. And may our hearts overflow with gratitude as we reflect on the wonder of who you are and what you have done for us. Lord, help us to live our lives in, in worshipful obedience, proclaiming your goodness to all the ends of the earth. And in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Trey, and all of our musicians for leading us in the music this morning. Good to be with you today. Uh, since I saw you last, uh, Vanessa and I uh, got a uh, double blessing. Uh, I was able to attend a very uh, encouraging conference this past week, and it happened to be just a few miles around the freeway in Charlotte uh, from where our oldest uh, lives, uh, Ben, with his family. And so we uh, spent time with them and uh, three grandkids, four grandkids. Oops, I left somebody out. Four grandkids um, in their family. Um, got to hear the uh, best sermon of the week. Uh, this was a, a pastor's meeting, about 4,000 pastors at uh, Christ Community Church in Matthews. And uh, John Piper preached on Thursday night, and uh, his, his topic was, uh, don't give in to discouragement and don't quit, speaking to pastors. And uh, that's the sort of thing uh, all of us uh, who, who are in ministry, in vocational ministry, need to be reminded of and need to hear from time to time. And um, he touched on a subject that came up just a couple of uh, weeks ago in a Sunday morning uh, here at Crossroads, um, retirement. He, he said, God has a retirement plan for you. Remember, he's speaking to pastors. He said, it's called death, and it is glorious. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I needed to hear that. Uh, needed to be reminded. And uh, we may change uh, roles uh, as we get older, uh, but it was good to hear someone else say uh, that in the way we have started to practice uh, retirement, um, you just don't find that concept in Scripture uh, for, for God's servants. And, uh, um, well, that was, that was free. Uh, that was bonus uh, for today. We're in Luke 13, so if you uh, would open your Bibles, uh, there are nine verses at the beginning of this chapter uh, that we're going to take on this morning. Very interesting uh, passage because it touches upon a couple of contemporary events um, about which there really is no other record uh, in secular history or uh, in Scripture itself, but they are referenced and it's the context uh, around which a conversation and a teaching of Jesus occurs uh, that I believe is very important. Now, he, he deals with several subjects, and you can see them uh, on the screen right now. Judgment, mercy, repentance, and fruitfulness. But all of that comes out of a response to someone in the crowd bringing up an event that sounds like it had very recently occurred. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, explain that here in just a moment. It's all around the subject of how do we process it when bad things happen to some people, but not, but not to others? Is it because those who suffered tragedy were the greater sinners? That really is behind the question and why the subject was raised to Jesus. And it makes me wonder, makes me ask myself, do we ever catch ourselves wondering when something bad occurs in, in, in an individual's life, did they do something to bring that on? Or how about this? Someone you know has been hard on other people, and then finally, after watching them, just it looks like they're skating through life. 
making it hard on everybody else, and finally something terrible comes that way. Have you ever caught yourself saying something like this or thinking something like this? We might not be willing to say it out loud. Well, they had that coming. There's my honest sister over here. Well, we're going to look at Scripture today that started out, as I mentioned a moment ago, with these two events that had happened recently in Jerusalem. And people want to know, what was behind the tragedy that people suffered? Was it their sin? And in the process of responding to that, these subjects all flow out of Jesus' heart and his mind. So that's our outline. Big idea for today, when catastrophes happen, it is far too common that we wonder if the people impacted did something to bring that tragedy upon themselves. Now, I'm going to tell you where we're headed. Jesus, instead of telling us it's okay to sit around and wonder and speculate about uh, did somebody cause that? Is this payback uh, in some way? Does God work that way? Jesus calls us to look at ourselves instead of others, to repent of our sins, and to bear fruit in our living that comes from knowing and walking with Him. So He completely redirects the conversation and says, you're asking the wrong questions here. All right, with that, let's go to the Scripture. Luke 13, verse 1. There were some present at that very time. What time? At the very time of the, this long series of teachings that we've been looking at, chapter 12, where Jesus ended with saying, you need to settle things with God. Remember, he used that metaphor of Our relationship with God is something like uh, being headed into court and we're going to be standing before a a judge and we're going to have to give an account of our life. And if you're not good with God, if things are unsettled, the advice of Jesus, the instruction of Jesus is you need to settle things before you get to the judge. So at that very time, as all of these things are being spoken of, there were people who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So clearly it takes place, whatever took place, whatever happened, it took place in the temple. It probably happened at Passover time because the average Galilean would not be anywhere near the actual sacrifice of animals except at that time. And there is bloodshed. Clearly, there are people who have died, and Pilate was the one, the same Pilate that Jesus will stand before uh, on, on that night of his arrest. That same governor... He sends the order that whatever is going on in the temple area, Pilate orders apparently soldiers to retaliate. Take those people down. Was it an uprising, a rebellion? Was it uh, some other conversation that gets to be very loud and they're stirring up the crowd. We simply don't have those details, but nonetheless, there are people who have died, and the very blood of sacrifices made toward God is mingled in that setting with the blood of men who have been killed by Pilate's soldiers. Verse 2, without being told all that is going on in this conversation, we just cut to, Luke takes us to, the response of Jesus. And clearly he reads their heart, he reads their thinking, their attitude. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Which means that there were people in the crowd who raised this contemporary event 
and suggested that this wouldn't have happened to those men had they not been such great sinners. Now, this was not the only time this subject comes up. The subject of cause and effect, of sin in the minds of many people, being behind any sort of tragedy, any sort of suffering that someone might be experiencing. Remember the blind man and the question that people asked Jesus, whose sin was it that caused this man's blindness? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? So this is a recurring subject. And Jesus, in verse 3, in a complete pivot from where people are trying to take the conversation, he says, you need to look at your own life. No, I tell you because, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So get your eyes off of other people who are going through catastrophic events as you wonder about what did they do to bring that on. Stop thinking like that. And Jesus says, look inside at your own heart. If you're concerned about sin, look at your own sin. And repent. Turn away from that sin. Because if you don't repent, this ties back to that end of chapter 12, doesn't it? Unless you settle things with God, you're going to die, but you're going to die forever. Eternal death. You will perish. And now Jesus, we don't have any reason to think that somebody in the crowd has raised this question. They might have, but the way Luke puts this account together Jesus himself says, oh, and if you, I, I, know, I know there's been a lot of conversation about what happened at the tower. Once again, we don't know anything about the details. What was the tower? What was its purpose? There's just speculation. It seemed to have happened. It definitely happened in the Jerusalem vicinity. There is, I read some speculation. It might have been a part of the wall it might have been a part of an aqueduct, water uh, distribution, improvement project that was going on at the time. It's all guessing. But it's a workplace disaster. Eighteen people on whom the tower in Siloam fell, and it killed them. And Jesus, because he knows, again, they are thinking this way, he asks this question, do you think? By the way, he was really good at that. People ask a question, he answers the question with a question. It's sort of typical rabbinical teaching. Do you think that they, those 18 men who died while working, that they were worse offenders than all of the others who live in Jerusalem? And Jesus answers this question, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So he repeats, repeats himself. So let's look at these, these four themes that flow out of this whole conversation, the instruction of Jesus on this day. First, the subject of judgment. We will always make massive mistakes in interpreting events when we insist on passing judgment on the cause, the causes of the tragedy. Now, that doesn't mean we ought not take a good look in the case of something that affects a large number of people, investigate, come to some conclusions. But Jesus here is talking about that sort of personal one-on-one -on -one analysis. Oh, someone died? Well, clearly, this must have been God's punishment, God's judgment 
on them. We have no way of knowing that. We don't have that kind of insight or wisdom. There isn't always a distinct cause and effect when it comes to tragic events. Now, is there sometimes cause and effect? Of course there is. Someone gets drunk, they get behind a wheel, they wreck, they kill themselves. That's a cause and effect. It's not judgmental to simply be aware of the circumstances. But what Jesus is warning us about is running around speaking authoritatively about things that we know nothing about. Now, does God judge? Absolutely. And I'll just, for the third time, point you back to Luke 12, 58. Settle the dispute before you wind up before, and God is presented to us as the judge. Don't wait until it's too late. And when you're standing in front of the judge, it's too late if you haven't done business with him yet. But is every tragedy a direct result of God's judgment on someone's sin? And the answer to that is no. Every type of suffering that people endure as human beings, that people experience as human beings, is not automatically tied to another person's sin or their own sin. We need to understand Jesus points us toward mercy. We need to be merciful to those who are suffering. That, that to me, would be part of what has Jesus so agitated with their way of trying to analyze these these contemporary events. Where's the mercy in your heart? Are you just going to automatically communicate out to 18 families whose husbands, whose fathers died in a tragic construction accident? Are you going to communicate to them that you are certain their father must have been a great sinner or this wouldn't have happened? Where is the mercy? So we need to be merciful to those who are suffering regardless of what kind of suffering it is. Not find some strange joy in it. One way to be merciful to another person is by, in fact, not trying to figure out why the thing has happened to them. When you're in the middle of suffering, the last thing you want are explanations, especially from other people. Job had unspeakable tragedy, and much of it so mysterious in the way God works that Even with reading the book of Job, we struggle to explain what happened to him and his family. But if you want a positive example, they start out very positively. Look at the the end of the second chapter of Job. Three friends show up. By the way, it says they made an appointment with one another to go see Job. pretty insightful. They hear, they talk amongst one another, they say, we've all known Job for a long while, we need to go be with him. And they start out so well. If you read Job 2 verses 12 and 13, it says, they saw that his suffering was great, so there is an empathetic, merciful, initial response. They showed sympathy and comfort, and they did this primarily by, the text says, they sat for seven days with Job without saying a word. Are we humanly capable of that? Ask God. The next time you see someone suffering, ask God to be merciful to that person, even if you dislike them. Ask God to show mercy to the person who is in pain. 
I can't for the life of me remember what exactly happened, but several years ago, somebody died unexpectedly within our church. And it was made known primarily on Facebook by the family. I remember that much. But what stuck in my mind and came back to my mind this week as I read these words from Luke 13 was a three-word prayer and post by one of our elders who, after the family described what had happened, he said simply, Lord, have mercy. All the rest of us being way too wordy. And he just said, Lord, have mercy. And what a beautiful prayer and a beautiful attitude of the heart. God's mercy when you're suffering. God's mercy is what you need. Not the analysis of your friends about why in the world this thing has happened to you. Let's be merciful toward people as well. Not just pray for God to be merciful to them, but for us to be merciful to them. Even if we don't particularly care for them. I'll put it like this. Don't be an Eliphaz. You know who he is? He's one of those three friends who started out so well with Job. So for seven days, he contains himself. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't try to explain to Job anything. And then he can't contain himself. And I guess on verse 8, or, or on day 8, Eliphaz begins to speak. He's the first one out of the three. And in Job 4, verse 8, he says to Job, now get this, Job's lost his family. He's lost his business. He's lost his health. And Eliphaz says, as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Job, I don't know of any explanation for this other than you must be a really great sinner to be suffering like this. How horrible. If anything, that is a belief in karma, not the gospel. You're not Hindu, most of you. You're not Buddhist. So as Christians, we need to stop saying things that are connected to those false religions. Let's go to the theme of repentance. What does Jesus teach us in these words about repentance? In fact, I want to take you back further than this. In Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus has been baptized. He has gone into the wilderness to prepare himself spiritually for public ministry. John has been arrested by this point. And some of Jesus' first public words come in verse 15, Mark 1, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. You cannot understand the gospel without repentance. Jesus, in fact, says there must be repentance and faith. All of us, according to Scripture, all of us need to repent, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. He is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. How do I not die eternally? Well, it involves repentance. Turning away from sin and turning to God. Let me give you a definition. This is not going to be on the screen or on your Notes in your bulletin if you're using that. To repent means to change the mind. To relent. You've been thinking about things, your own life, your own behavior in one way, your own attitudes in one way. You relent from that. You have a new mindset. 
Theologically, it involves regret and sorrow, accompanied by a true change of the heart toward God. A genuine change in the thinking and in the heart results in a change of behavior. So repentance is more than getting emotional at a worship service or a revival meeting. That might be repentance, but it also might be, be being caught up in the emotion of a, of a service or even the behavior of other people. True biblical repentance is a complete change of the way I've been thinking about God, the way I've been thinking about myself, the way I've been thinking about my own behavior, my own attitudes. And I turn away from my rebellion against God and I turn toward God in submission to Him. And if repentance does not does not result in an outward change of behavior, then all I've done is engage in some behavior modification, which always is short-lived. Can you say New Year's resolution? (laughs) Repentance is actually a work of God in a person's life. It's not just waking up and making a decision, making a determination that today is the, the, the start of a new day. No, it starts with a work of God in us. In Acts 11, Peter has come back to Jerusalem, to the church. He, he is reporting there about what, God, what he's been seeing God do among the Gentiles. Peter himself has struggled mightily with this. Is the gospel for all people? And the Lord finally convinces him, yes, yes, Peter. And you don't have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. It is for the Gentiles as well. And in Acts 11, verse 18, listen to this. When they heard, when the church in Jerusalem heard these things, they fell silent. And then they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Where does true repentance come from? It comes from the work of God in a man or a woman's life. Their analysis of Peter's story, his reports, his testimony was not. And then we had such great weeping and sorrow that that, uh, we encouraged people to feel that, that they decided, they decided they would live different lives. No, the way they interpret it God showed grace and mercy in the lives of people by working in their hearts, giving them new desires, and working in their minds to give them a new way to think. And out of that repentance came faith to believe. What does repentance look like? It may very well include sorrow. Luke 15 tells the story. We will be there sometime this summer when we finally get to the the great 15th chapter with all the lost things and people that Luke 15 tells us about. And Jesus weaves that beautiful story of a young man who leaves his father and goes out and lives wildly, driven by his own desires, until he comes literally to the end of himself. I want to read verses 17, 18, and 19 from Luke 15. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise. I will go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. That is a picture of repentance. I have offended you, Father. And I don't want to do that anymore. I want to have a relationship with you, even if it means I'm living out in the servants' quarters I don't have any right to expect anything from you, but I come to you, Father, and I ask for your mercy. Jesus' point of emphasis back to Luke 13 
It's a call for you and me to stop obsessing about others and what happened to them and pay close attention to our own life and our own sin. Be certain of this. Where there is repentance, God gives forgiveness. Where there is repentance, there is cleansing. There is a lifting of the guilt of that sin. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself, speaking of Jesus, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. You see the shift in attitude and behavior? The shift in status before God. We go from sinful and separated to righteousness by the righteousness of Christ. And Peter adds this, by his wounds you have been healed. And by the way, that has nothing to do with your physical disease. That has everything to do with your spiritual disease of what sin does to our relationship with God. And what heals the disease of sin? It is what Christ did on the cross. We turn away from our efforts at self-fulfillment and self salvation and back to Jesus who's the only one who can deal with any of that Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 21 for our sake he made him speaking of Jesus he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God and one last word here Repentance is not ever supposed to be a one-time event that happened when you were saved. I need to practice repentance as a daily spiritual discipline. Just as much as I need to pray, just as much as, as I need to worship my God, just as much as any spiritual discipline that you happen to treasure and practice. We all need to practice repentance daily. When Martin Luther stood in Wittenberg and nailed his 95 theses, his 95 complaints on the door of that church, you know what number one was? I'm glad you asked me. Here it is. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he intended that the entire life of believers on earth should be a constant repentance. Always checking, not other people, checking myself. Where's my heart? Where's my mind? Do my behaviors bring glory to God? So you see Jesus in his perfect teaching. He spins the whole conversation around and says, you are looking at the wrong things. Now back to Luke 13. At this point, as he often did, Jesus tells a parable, a story to drive home what he wanted people to remember in this moment. In 13.6, he told a parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it. Anybody who's ever planted a fruit tree, you know what that is. Is this the year I planted a young sapling and it bloomed? Am I going to get a peach this year? Well, this man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He comes at the appropriate season, time of season looking for fruit on it. He finds none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now, I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. This is not the first time he took a walk in his vineyard. This is the third year he's come out hoping for some figs. 
and there are no figs on this tree. Cut it down. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? It's not only not producing fruit, it's taking up space. And it might even be doing some damage to the soil here. And he answered, the vine dresser, the man who works this garden, appeals to the owner and says, Sir, can't we give it one more year? Let it alone this year also. And, and, and he goes on to describe, I will give it extra attention. I will dig around it, suggesting maybe it's root bound. I'll dig around the tree. I'll put on some manure. I'll fertilize it. And then if it should bear fruit next year, you have what you were hoping for. Well, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. One of the things that I think that asks us to consider, because clearly he's not just having an agriculture lesson here. Remember, there's, there's an application. There's a spiritual application to all these stories. Jesus is talking about people. Jesus is talking about the product of our life. He's talking about religious people, people who say, I believe in God, I walk with God, I serve God. But he's also saying some people who say all of those things, they say all the right things, if you look closely, there is no evidence of God's work in their life. No fruit. And so I wonder... Do I ever go to the Lord and plead with Him to give my friend a little more time? Lord, I understand you've been very patient already, and there's no evidence of salvation in my friend. There's no evidence of faith. You've already given them plenty of time. Would you please give them just a little bit longer? Would you be a little more patient as Peter described so that they would have time to repent. And oh, by the way, Lord, I'll make this commitment. If you'll give them a little more time, I will do some digging around their roots. And I'm going to put some things into their life. I will be intentional to try to fertilize some things. I will try to put some things into them that will cause them to think and possibly start to respond to the gospel. Do we have that kind of heart for people? Biblical fruitness, fruitfulness in the spirit produced. I'm going to try that again. Biblical fruitfulness is the spirit produced byproduct of repentance, of being saved by the Lord and having a consistent connection with the Lord. These things are tied together. This is not a disjointed add-on by Jesus. It all flows together. We do not bear spiritual fruit by simply having a religious heritage. All of us must repent and believe. Back in the third chapter, this was not exaggerating too much to say this feels like it was a couple of years ago but in Luke 3 verses 8 through 10 do you remember having read these words having studied these words bear fruits in keeping with repentance see there's one of the places where we see the connection repentance leads to behavior change to life changes Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Same imagery. 
as in the parable today. And the crowds ask him back in Luke 3, verse 10, what shall we do? Such a great question. What do we do? Maybe you're wondering today, what do I do differently? And I'll point you back to repentance. It starts with repentance. Remember, repentance is not just turning away from something, it's turning to something. The work of the Holy Spirit produces certain realities in our life. We turn away from our selfish living and we turn to a life submitted to the Lord. Responsive to the Spirit. The life of Jesus in us. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Is that not a description of Jesus? So the fruit of the Spirit is the life of Jesus coming through me and you. Abiding is another huge part of what Jesus and his overall teaching tells us is necessary for fruitfulness in our lives. Abiding means remaining, staying close, staying connected to Jesus. And it is the only way we will see spiritual fruit in our lives. Anything other than that, again, is simple self-improvement, which always falls short, and we give up. I'm going to read one more passage of Scripture, and then we're ready to pray. In John chapter 15, Jesus is again using imagery from agriculture. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does, does bear fruit, he prunes. By the way, that's, that's one of the one of the reasons, one of the many reasons we don't need to be sitting around trying to judge another person and their life experiences because we don't know. Maybe it is not the discipline of God for lack of fruitfulness. Maybe it is because they are fruitful and God says, I'm going to encourage even more growth out of you, more fruit out of your life by pruning you. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me. There's that word. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. You sort of get the feeling that's important. He keeps saying it. Jesus is the vine, we're the branches, not the other way around. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Why is there no fruit in some of our lives? Because we're not connected to Jesus. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and he withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I loved you Abide, live, remain, be connected in my love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Perfect, true. It has all authority. And my prayer is that we will believe it. And we will practice it. 
God, I pray for anyone in this worship service who may be suffering this morning. God, be merciful to them. We pray that you would show mercy. God, for any who need this morning to repent because they are not facing you, they're facing away from you, my prayer is that you would grant them repentance, that you would so work in their mind and their heart right now that they would do an about face. Lord, if they have never trusted Christ as Savior, if they've never submitted their life to Him as Lord, we pray again that Your Spirit would work in them to save them. And God, for Your many sons and daughters who come this morning sincerely to worship You, to study Your Word, to hear from You, I pray you will take, that your spirit would take whatever portion of this scripture is the greatest need in our lives and give us direction. Give us confidence that we're going to, we're going to start acting upon the truth that is your word. Lord, thank you for your patience. But I pray we will not presume upon your patience. Help us this morning to respond as we need to, as we need to, to get for a few moments our eyes off of other people, our minds off of other people, and make sure that things are settled between us and you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you would like to stand, let's do that together. Let's sing. Let's respond to God's word. There's peace that outlasts darkness. Hope that's in the blood. There's future grace that's mine today That Jesus Christ has won So I can face tomorrow For tomorrow's in your hands And all I need you will provide Just like you
Some of you are avid readers and you probably would frown on people picking up a book and going to the back page because you like the process of reading that whole book before you get to the end. Even if you've never read the whole Bible, it's okay. I want you to go to the last two or three pages and read it because that's what that song is all about. It tells us how God's story ends. In fact, it covers all people, so we don't even need to say 